Bubble presents the No Code Hustle, where we speak with founders, builders, and makers who are building the next generation of tech products all without code. I'm your host, Eric Israni. Welcome, everyone. I'm here with KP, founder of Kappa. Thanks for coming on, KP. You're welcome. Glad to be here. I'm glad to have you. So we're going to jump right in. Why don't you tell me a little bit about how you came across Bubble? Well, um, I've known about Bubble uh, for maybe two years now, and um, I really started my no-code journey about, you know, in October 2018, and uh, mostly from Product Hunt friends and uh, indie hacker community, and I've heard about Bubble as the full stack um, no-code tool, and uh, it's just that, you know, I, I never really got to testing it or playing with it. Uh, mostly because I was trying to like pace myself to go from the easiest no code tool out there and build the smallest scope, you know, product and iterate over time. And I kind of saved the best for the last, you know, and, uh, and I truly, I think it truly worked out really well for me. And uh, I shipped about eight no code products and, you know, most of them are projects. They're not really money making big products, but they're, they're great iterations for me to get better as a no code maker and uh, finally got my hands to it. Um, I think December 2019, last, last early last year. Um, and uh, that's when I built uh, my first Bubble project called Writer's Compound. And uh, I thoroughly loved working on Bubble. It's as uh, notorious as it is, there is a learning curve. And so I did um, invest in some tutorials and YouTube uh, videos and slowly worked myself up to, uh, you know, building, building a real product on it. So really excited, man. It was amazing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's great. And so before we get into Writer's Compound, why don't you tell me a little bit more about your background? Did you come from a tech background? Did you come from a product background? What, are, you know, what is your, what's your skill set before coming and working with no-code tools? Sure. I've, I've always been a product owner, product manager all my life. Um, I mean, I, my um, background really is very, very mixed and diverse. I've had, uh, you know, I've had a master's in electrical engineering, so I do... Uh, understand code, you know. I've, I've written a little bit of code back in when I was in, in college, but um, I've intentionally decided to not go down the code path, and I wanted always to build a community, an audience, and a product. So to me, that's just more joyful. I don't know. I can't explain why. And I think a lot of people, you know, are forever lost in this. Like, should I code? Should I no code? And I think I just took the decision not to learn code early on, which, which is probably unpopular now, but. I just decided not to do that and instead just build an audience, build products, build iterations and, and build, um, you know, the, um, the mindset of a maker. And so I've always been a product manager at work, full-time jobs. And on the side of, I've been tinkering with ideas, you know, with, with no code. So technical, I have the technical, I think mindset, but not non-coder. Okay. So no coding background, but, you were around product, you understood product. Yes. And you started doing what is largely being considered now, I think, the chief way to launch a new idea, which is building that audience. Yeah. Right? And so for as long as I've known you, you've been very community minded. Yeah. And so why don't you tell me a little bit more about what that means to you and what you've been doing to build up that audience? Great question. I think um, like many founders or wannabe founders and makers, you know, I think I've had to learn it the hard way. I've uh, first two, three years of, uh, you know, this journey, I think I just wanted to build something cool. And I thought that people would just come, you know, why not? Like, you know, building the coolest thing ever. And why would people not just show up? Right. But uh, I slowly learned that that's not how it works, you know, and the reality kicked in and there's so many innumerable amazing products being built today around the world. And it's not that the product itself is going to just simply draw people in. It's the community around it, the word of mouth around it, you know, and the promised land the product is promising is what gets people excited. Nobody wakes up and goes to product time and be like, you know what, I'm going to try the seventh product in the line on the list. You know, it's, it's really about the word of mouth and the groundswell. And, you know, we've chatting, we've been chatting about this for a while now. And uh, I mean, there's many ways to do it. I think you could buy it. You could, you know, uh, fake it. You can do all those things, but the most authentic way to do it is let people 
get a taste of your product, get a taste of your vision and let them talk to each other and bring in friends. I, it took forever for me to get that lesson right. And so I realized that this is not an easy skill. It's almost like an art kind of skill. Like you have to learn you know, a unique organic way to do it, doing it. And so I gave myself uh, multiple iterations to get it right. So that's why I always chose small, tiny products in the beginning. And my, my goal was not really the product. The goal was to just get people excited over time and build leverage. So that's, that's the thesis. Yeah, so real quick, favorite platform to connect with people and build your audience? Uh, great question. I, I wish there was one magical platform where you can just go on, log in, and you can get an audience, you know, but uh, it doesn't work like that. And you just have to go where people are, you know, and, and just um, try to serve them and try to like solve their problems or offer solutions or uh, suggestions. So to me, that was Twitter, you know, for the longest I've been off Twitter and only on Instagram or Facebook and maybe on LinkedIn a little bit, but I never really tapped into Twitter as a learning network, as a, um, as an idea network until, like I said, two years ago when I started my no code journey. And I started like with brand new, with a brand new Twitter account because all my past Twitter accounts were all about like movie reviews and shit. So this is my first ever like brand new intentional um, maker Twitter account. And uh, I started with zero followers. And I, you know, one of my favorite accounts that I followed on Twitter was in the wall. And uh, he kept delivering super high value. And I noticed that, oh, you know what? Twitter is like, Twitter can be a great learning um, network, and which also means that I can teach, you know, to a community and audience as well. So every day I, I would get up and try to, you know, learn from the best. And if I did something that was unique and new and I learned something, I would teach to the rest. You know, so that was my mode. I agree. The, the number one thing that I try and think about whenever I build community, whenever I see other people building community is value. Right. And I think that's also the thesis that underpins no code. Yeah. It's, it's not so much about where you are or how you're doing it, right? Whether it be traditional coding methods or no code, it's what is the value you are delivering? And with no code, you either quicker, right? Right. You know, yeah. I think no, no code shortcuts the journey to get to value quicker. And it's almost sobering for a lot of makers because they're like, they're living in this fancy delusional, like I'm building the uh, best like superhuman for X or, you know, Uber for Y. And, you know, when they finally see it, the value is going to be so immense and they're gonna, it's going to blow their mind kind of thing, right? But that's a fancy delusional, uh, you know, way to live. You know, the, the better way is to be, is to, is to give them a little taste of what the promise is, which I think is the MVP or a V1 or V2, which can be easily done with no code. And let them tell you how they view this product or how important this is in their, ri- in their life, you know? So it's, it's very sobering because a lot of people are used to like six months MVP or eight months um, V1, you know? And then they're like, okay, at least you live the six months of like delusion, but with no code, you're like, you just, you're gonna hear it very soon. Yeah, it's, it's a certain mix of arrogance to think that you know exactly what your user wants, right? Yeah. And yeah. then you get stuck in these feature traps where you're like, well, I mean, build more features. I mean, make right. it super robust and it's six months. Why not make it eight months before I launch right. anyway? And then you never actually get to a place where you're adding value. Launch, yeah. I think the combination of two things. One is, you know, having having the mindset of just ship it, you know, which is uh, you have to ship before you're ready. You know, I have this famous, you know, this famous line from um, Reid Huffman who says that if your first MVP or your first iteration was not embarrassing, you've shipped, you know, you've shipped too late. Right. And I mean, I mean, paired that with just regular, you know, just life wisdom, right. You're never ready for the big moment. Like I remember um, the day before my wedding, I was not ready. You know, I was like, I mean, I was not hundred percent ready. I freaked out. I, everybody has that, you know? So, but I, you know, you still, you still um, have to ask yourself, like, am I doing this because I'm trying to be perfect and come off as a perfect, um, you know, exhibition exhibition to the community or the user or whatever or am i doing this you know to the to solve a problem that they have or to serve them in a unique way and if you put it that way you should be thrilled to ship it 
right? Because what if that one guy who was who woke up today with the problem went to bed without having your solution? So it becomes more about them, was less about you. And that's back to your point about arrogance. I think it's mostly ignorance or fear, insecurity, I think. So the combination of just ship it and knowing that, you know, you have to invest a lot of time in making sure that you hear and listen to what they want is the golden combo, you know? I agree. I absolutely agree. And so as you've been building out these products, as you've been building out the, the audiences, you've come up with different ideas. Can you tell me a little bit about the process of coming up with an idea and figuring out what it is your audience wants and in particular writer's compound? Right. So um, I, I'd always had ideas, man. I've always been a guy with like more than 20, 30 ideas. You know, my plate was always full, even when I couldn't ship anything or build anything. Um, but the more I got intentional about the process and the more I realized that, okay, I'm going to pace myself and I'm going to do one a month or, you know, one in two months or whatever. I realized, I, you know, I, beca- I had to choose only one for that, you know, uh, particular instance. And there would be like 20 or 30 in my notebook. And I, I, I'd always uh, documented. I took this from, I think, Tim Ferriss, who said, like, you know, always write down 10 ideas a day. And I did that for maybe like two, three months. I remember a friend of mine and I, we kind of had an accountability challenge where he and I every day would spend like 10 minutes at 11 a.m. or something. Like this is last year. And we would just jot down 10 ideas. And we had a mountain of ideas to pick from. You know? And all of them were, some of them were like, whoa, this is a big one, but some of them were like silly, you know, because you can't get 10 new ideas every day, you know. Um, so I had I had a stash of ideas and every time I had to pick one, I would just use my intuition. You know, I would just use, uh, it's hard to describe what I use because it's, it's just intuition and I, there was no big logic behind it. I just picked the one that I thought was relevant to the times, you know, and that's another thing is, 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 as I was doing these iterations, I've learned that timing is very important in, in product. You know, and a lot of the successful founders will tell you this. Market timing, like, completely gives you, I mean, either aids you or, you know, restricts you, right? The tailwinds from the market. So you have to look at some of these things and, um, and you have to just read the room. Like, you know, when I launched my first product, it was called uh, do things that don't scale.com. And it's basically, it was, a, it was an aggregation. It was a microsite of um, the world's, you know, best unscalable hacks that the founders had done over the years, you know. And um, Paul Graham wrote a big article on that. It was really popular, do things that don't scale on his site. And there was, I think, four or five references already. So I started there and then I went to Hacker News. So it's, again, reading the room. I think Hacker News was the perfect destination because, A, they're all Paul Graham fans or strong strongly opposing fans or whatever. Uh, second, there were most of them were founders or they lived through these unscalable hacks. So it boosted, it automatically, the question went to the homepage and we had, I think, 265 comments and, you know, stories. So they really filled it out for me, the form. I didn't have to do anything. So I just surfaced, I took all of those things and I put it into a little uh, error table and then I turned it into a little front end website using table2site.com. And eventually it became um, do things that don't scale. It was number one on product hunt. Product hunt. It, it went viral, you know, and I just read the room. You know, I just knew that that was the audience and uh, I knew that that was valuable to them and to me. And I just did it. So it, it's a, I mean, I know that I, I was joking with my friend uh, at the time and said, like, I can't repeat the success because, you know, you can't second, you can't do the same thing over and over again, in the same room, you know? So that's a, uh, yeah, that's my, Quick aside, I I read your site. Like I was on your site when you launched it. Really? Before I did not I- know that was you. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of people don't know. Yeah, a lot of people I have to, when I tell them like, hey, I built this, they're like, what? But is that what, I'm like, yeah, that's what I'm talking about, you know, so. Yeah, I spent a good amount of time reading through and checking uh, that site out. Thank that you. Was great. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. I, I still have the domain. I still run it. You know, it doesn't make me any money. You know, it, to me, it's just, you know, as a maker, one of the things if I want anybody to take away from this podcast is if you figure out a way to have a full-time job or if, if we are like decently, you know, relatively employable, just be a maker out of your joy. 
you know, because, you know, that's what I think Steve Jobs would say, right? Like he would say, like, just tinker and just keep playing around with things until like stay hungry, stay foolish thing, like until you find the one that you think is going to change the world or it's going to be a startup, you know, worth investing your time and energy in. You know, I think a lot of us, including me when I was younger, wasted, you know, precious lifetime and energy trying to dwell on ideas, trying to like be the perfect, the op, the the optimal maker. And I think there's no optimal maker. Everyone's got their unique story. Um, you just have to, you know, find joy in doing things. And if they fail, they fail. If they succeed, like do things that don't scale, like you said, you know, it's great. But just half the time, you don't even know the impact. One of the, one of the lines that I was reading uh, from from a book, and it was talking about how 90, 80% of your life, you don't even know the impact you created in other people's lives, you know? So you have to just live with the fact that and hope that maybe it did some positive impact for the world. And that's the best ROI you can get, you know? So well, as you just heard, you've done that already. Thank you. <laughs> Years <laughs> apart, literally states apart. Right. Literally, yeah. <laughs> so let's... Um, Let's take a look at Writer's Compound. You want to show us around a little bit? Sure. I mean, uh, I have a couple monitors here, so let me make sure that I open the right one. So while you're bringing that up, right, I want to say that, uh, again, thanks for coming on. And, uh, and your Twitter feed, I gotta be honest, is one of the most inspirational Twitter feeds that I follow. I appreciate it. Thank you. You know, I, I, uh, I, I mostly used to do that just for myself. And uh, I've heard from a couple of people, including my current co-founder, Gil, which we will get to later. He said the same exact words. He said, it's one of the most positive things I look forward to every day, KP, you know. So I appreciate that. You know? yeah. And uh, while you're bringing up the site, can you tell us a little story about how you chose that photo? I chose my photo. Oh my God. Okay. I, I, uh, okay. So I had, I had, a I had some, um, I had an older photo and it was just, it was just janky and raggedy to be honest. It was not great. I just threw something in there for Twitter, but this one, my sister came home from, I mean, came to the U S recently and brought a couple photos from my childhood in India. And I grew up in India and I had, um, I had a fantastic, but very challenging childhood, but, Again, I think challenges build you up. So they built me up and uh, she brought she brought a few photos and that was the silliest picture. And I, I just thought I just thought that was that was, you know, something silly to put on Twitter. Yeah, and memorable. And I memorable. Remember. But yeah. by the way, seconds later she reminded me that was me if you if you actually zoom in or something, the full picture is basically me holding on to the handlebars of a bike and on a on a terrace, which only happens in India. Seconds later my sister reminded me that I went and crashed into a wall. So that was me giving the sneaky look that I'm going to go crash this without, without having the wisdom. So. <laughs> All right. So here's the, uh, can you see my screen? I can. All right. So let's do writer's compound. Well, it locked us in automatically, which is great. But so this is the actual app mm -hmm. and the app itself is built on bubble, you know, and I, I, this has been the best thing that I built on bubble so far. You know, it's uh, essentially the, the premise of writers compound is that it's supposed to be a tight knit community of um, writers who um, wanted to get feedback or wanted to read someone's work before it went to the public domain. Right. And one trend I noticed is a lot of my friends and makers and writers had their own personal websites and they would blog or they would share on their sites. And some of them were doing on Medium, but Medium was de declining rapidly. A lot of my you know, fellow writers were not um, writing on Medium anymore, but they were just publishing on their own sites. But it would be, for me, it was impossible to go through like all of their 20, 30 different websites and read a daily feed of what they're posted, right? And that's one problem. The other problem was like, there's no way to kind of get like a first look at someone's work. You always see the polished, highly edited, like photographed, photoshopped um, version. And I just wanted to combine both these two. It's how can I get the first look of someone's work and how can I 
um, you know, make sure that I have a feed of everybody's um, first looks. So that's really what Writers Compound is. So when you go here, it lets you create new. Um, and I used to plug in uh, BDK plugin, mm -hmm. plug, uh, shout out to <laughs> Bubbles plugins. And it's in air mode, I think, right now. So it's everything, there's, you can't even see the border. It's really cool. It's just, you know, simple. And I like the minimal, minimal look. You know, and uh, that's it. You know, it's very yeah, it's very elegant. I like to think that it was very simplistic. You know, and then there's a you can throw in a couple, throw in a couple tags, and you can you know decide what format it is. You yeah. know, uh, you can see all of these were there was this is the vision to have like all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Now let's just say chartboard, and then you have a preview feature, and then you have a you know save draft. Let's go to preview. Um, and you can edit from here or you can just publish it. I'm gonna publish it and then delete it later. But here we go. So we go on top and the people can upload and download us. And uh, so essentially it's just, this flow is, is similar to Medium, you know, but like the beauty is Medium was built with probably, I don't know, like 20 guys, full-time developers. <laughs> I am one guy and this was built in like one, two months. So that's the power of, of uh, no code. Yeah, are you? Yeah, were you able to see everything I showed? I was. Sorry, I uh, no was coughing a little. <laughs> um, built a little um, profile page with your recent post. You know, I think what's amazing to me with Bubble and also just the mindset we're talking about is, you know, you can iterate over time. None of this was in V one. It was just like maybe create the new flow. Well, the new the new essay flow. Everything else came like a week after and then a week after and a week after. And people were, you know, the people who were on the site were like so amazed by how I could pull off like all of this. They thought I had this magical, like people helping me. And it was just me, you know, I didn't even have anybody to help. Um, like in terms of like contract work, you know, just me um, working with, um, working with the tutorials and learning from other makers for sure. But it was just, it was just tinkering around, you know? Yeah. And so, Oh, that looks great. Yeah, this is an interview series I wanted to do. And so you have everything in there. You have links, there's bolding, you have you basically have a, a full full blown web, full stack, yeah, app. yeah. And you can you can see other people on there. Do you know about how many people are, are using this right now? Right. So that's the one thing that I haven't fully invested my time in, which is community, which is ironic because now, you know, as I'm talking about community first. I, I did have 185 at the time, and I think it should be maybe two, over 200 today, um, early access signups. And um, I mean, 200 actual signups. And I think about 40 people um, became writers. They went through the whole flow and actually posted at least once. So, and then there's, you know, people like the wall and, you know, David and, and Sharath who, who posts more than once or more than twice a week. So it, it, I couldn't fully, you know, step back and just focus on community with, with the writer's compound because I was so busy learning the product, how to build product with, with Bubble. And, you know, like I said, I've never done a full stack. I've never had to decide like, hey, how do I store this uh, new post into a database? Like, should it be called post or should it be, how do I do comments under this thing, you know? So there was a lot of like uh, trial and error and just watching tutorials that went on this. And um, so the, the community that I have here is very organic, just from my Twitter. We didn't even go on Product Hunt, which is shocking to me because I'm always i the biggest advocate of launching on Product Hunt. Um, but, and at the time I was, so this is like, a, um, a, our, this podcast was supposed to be a month ago. So we're kind of like catching up, but um, roughly about, I think end of February, I was going to go on Product Hunt um, and March happened. And as you know, Kappa happened. So I, I'm taking a step back from Writer's Compound and um, you know, I'm in the process of finding it a new owner. So this is probably the first time I'm going to discuss this. I'm probably in the process of you know, moving it to a new owner, a uh, new maker, but I will be fully focused on Kappa from, from now on. Okay, well, before we dive into Kappa, I just want to say that for the time and energy you put into this, 
and for the skills that you're displaying here, this is incredible. This is great. And the fact that you built something and was able to, you were able to display enough value. You were to tell people that this is my product. This is how it's going to work. And you had 200 people sign up. Yeah. And then you, now you have active users. You're actively helping people. Right. Something with the product you built. That right. itself is a huge feat that yeah. with that, you know, previously would be insurmountable unless you right. know code. Impossible. I mean, I mean, like as a product guy, like I had to go harass like CTOs or engineers and other technical founders and like, you know, like offer them equities and, and you know, and maybe like cookies or whatever and just and forever be on the position of a lack of power and lack of agency. And I think that's one thing no code, you know, it's not people are like so confused about like how is no code going to I don't think it's going to replace code. It's just going to put power in the hands of people who never had power and agency, which is the biggest bullish bullish uh, use case for no code. Like it's not going to die. It's not going to go away because there will be always people wanting power to build things on their own. Right. It's like, and that's one thing that um, I've done a podcast with somebody um, earlier and uh, doing a wall. It's called Codeless. You know that with mm -hmm. admin. And that was my biggest bullish case. And that was in January. Uh, I didn't even start on Writer's Compound at the time. And I was telling him that no code is here to stay, 1,000% here to stay, as long as there are people who are willing to make something new out of nothing. And that is a bigger market than people who can code. People who can code is like 4%. And I'm the 90, 96%, you know? So it's, it's, it's an insanely powerful uh, paradigm shift. And, in, and as, in, as the future opens up, we're going to see more and more you know, KPs and Eric's, you know. I hope so. I am um, enjoying yeah. our conversation. I hope there's more of you. Yeah. Um, the, the one stat that I bring up to our community a lot when people ask me, where, where do you really see you fitting in? Like where, where's Bubble going? Is that in 2020, there's an estimated 1 million unfilled developer jobs for wow. traditional development. 1 million. And so whenever you're trying to build an idea, you're trying to get, uh, a product at the door, you're competing with people who are willing to pay top dollar for developing talent. And, and you're right, right. That power dynamic is totally shifted because there is this huge void. And the other thing I like to mention is that you know, writer's compound is great and I love it. Thank you. The Thank features you. you built in and everything. It's a clean UI. Thank um, you. UI took a lot of polishing. So my, my favorite compliment to this came from, Nate Washington, who you may have heard of, you know, who's the CTO of Coins, and uh, and he, I mean, he helped me out at the beginning because I had my UX was terrible. and went to him, and uh, I told him, like, dude, I appreciate what you've done with Coins because it's so beautiful, and it was built on Bubble. And I was like, I can't believe there's a real functioning startup, startups product with financial security baked into it, and real people using it to do savings or whatever. And it's all built on bubble. And so I went to him and he was in Atlanta and I told him, here's, here's where Writer's Compound looks. And it was at Friday. And it's, it's like, it's janky as shit. It's, it's not great. Help me out. And he gave me three or four suggestions. And he said, hey, let's catch up next week. Uh, you know, I'm going to go out of town this week or whatever. And we came, he came back next week and it was all cleaned up. And he said, dude, this is the most beautiful thing I've seen on <laughs> bubble. And I was like, thank you. You know, uh, so there was, there's a lot of labor and love that went into this, you know, and uh, and that's why it, I think back to our earlier conversation, you know, it, it should be less about metrics, less about all the uh, numbers and like growth and hacking and all that. To, it's, it should be more about joy and whatever platform you choose to do so in, if you have the mindset of joy and just building it for the fun of it, you know, you're inevitably going to succeed. Great. Put that on your Twitter. Also very inspirational. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, that's the kind of shit that I tweet all the time anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's that's why I love following you. Thank um, you. But so like now let's uh let's get into Cup a little bit. Why don't you tell me a little bit about the idea and, and where you're at right now? So Cup came about um during the crisis and as um as the world was shifting into more and more um, social distancing practices and, you know, staying shelter at home, sheltering home, 
you know, mandates. Um, I've wanted to keep in touch with friends on the internet, you know, and I've, we, I've always been someone who didn't care for, you know, what medium we were talking to someone, you know, and I always thought the conversations were more important than the context or the, the rooms or, you know, the in-person we sit in and all that. So I've run, I've been running a program called No Code Camp with Joe Brown, who was on your podcast previously from New Code called No Code Camp. And, um, and we've been like helping other uh, No Code makers around the world every Thursday, 8 a.m. It was, kind of, it, was kind of, it was kind of like an office hours program that he and I just completely uh, impulsively started. And we've been running it for eight to nine weeks now. And it's, it was, it's getting killer attention. And we're all like, it's not um, based on a fee or anything. It's all free, but we're sold out for the rest of the month. And it's been getting so much attention. And I realized that, you know what? People are willing to talk on the internet, on a one-on-one video platforms, you know, um, and there's no hesitation anymore. You know, we're in a whole new world right now. So Kappa came about with the premise that this behavior will continue to, you know, stay the same and maybe even arise dramatically in the next 10 years, you know. And so Kappa's goal is to connect people who semi know each other through Twitter or other online communities. If you're part of a podcast community in a Facebook group and you all semi know each other, um, Kappa adds the depth to your to your social graph by letting you do one-on-one video chats this way so we take we take your um, social graph and we help you you know connect with each other through matching and it's right now randomized so you can imagine you can be matched with somebody in your uh, community that you've never met uh, but you can choose you can choose a criteria and say i want someone from no code but also who went to mandibult you know that kind of thing so very cool. And so I know you guys are in beta, beta right now, but what's if someone's interested, what can they do to learn more? Where can they check you out? Is there a wait list? Is, yes. is there a homepage? Yes, there is. So right now we're at um, getcuppa.io, www.getcuppa, C-U-P-P-A dot I-O. Um, we also have a domain called meetcuppa.com, which we will soon launch and we haven't launched yet, but um, people can go on there and sign up for the wait list. And I am thrilled with the response we've been getting, you know, it's definitely everything I wished I had for writers compound, but that's back to the point about, you know, market and the tailwinds. Right. And I think right now with social distancing, everybody is um, yearning for connection, social connection you know, through video and you are, we're, reading news articles about zoom dating and zoom everything on zoom like pilates and yoga and like people are doing all kinds of you know activities on zoom so so kappa has got now 600 i think 610 um early access users waiting and most of them are tweeting at me impatiently about like when can i get in when can i get in so we're going to give better access to 50 at a time and uh so that's where you can sign up and uh, be one of the first few users to test out kappa and guess what? I think I have to cover this for sure. Kappa, the beta, was is hundred percent built on Bubble. That's great. That's incredible. Yes, yes. and it was uh, the, it's my co-founder now, who's uh, Michael Gill. You, some of you may know from the No Code community. He runs this. He ran this. He still runs a really popular uh, newsletter called No Code Coffee. And so when when Kappa's you know, when Kappa was getting, was getting initial traction and getting a lot of attention, I called him and I said, dude, you know, we have to partner up and do this together. Uh, I, I want to run community and I'd love, to, I'd love for you to run the product and the tech. And he immediately agreed. And uh, he's brewing all the, uh, all the magic into Kappa right now. So uh, all kudos to him. He's, he's, the beta is unbelievable because I've never seen a no-code product that looks 99.99% like a fully coded web app because it's got the zoom api it's got twitter api it's got google calendar api it's got all of these things to build on bubble it's insane that is insane um and so do you want to maybe give us a, a pre a preview of the the home page right now oh okay we can do that i'll just give you a preview of the home page yeah just a quick preview just so people can see what you're talking about yep so this is kappa and it's a uh, 
it's a British term for like a cup of tea, a cup of coffee. And I just thought it was such a fun pronunciation and just thought that would be, you know, a great name. So Kappa, you can drop your email and, you know, Twitter, you know, Twitter um, handle. We're going with this is quirky um, tagline, so in social and distancing platform. <laughs> and it's pre-vetted in a way that you're seeing, you're mostly, you know, you're not just meeting with an internet, internet random stranger like chat roulette. Mm-hmm. Um, we're trying to make sure that the quality of the people on Kappa is is high. There's a bit of randomness, as I talked about, serendipity, you know, but you can also choose who you want to, you know, in the future versions. And uh, you could be with one-on-one or up to four. And it's a 30 minute chat, no strings attached. And we're getting, and you'll see, as I can show, maybe I'll show you this. This is just a slice of all the tweets we're getting. And it's nothing like I've ever seen in my whole life. Yeah, that's cool. It's insane. It's like the wall of, uh, of social approval. Right. It's insane. And then there are actually a lot of them are pissed at me that because I'm not giving them real beta access. You know, so <laughs> <laughs> I hit the agony tweets. These are just the pleasant tweets. <laughs> That's yeah. the sign of a uh, of a good value proposition when the mob is at the yeah. gate. Just yeah. right in. <laughs> I think you know we're, we're trying to be intentional um, because we we definitely know that this is a you know iterative product. And back to my whole thesis from the, from the beginning of this podcast, right? I believe in iterations, and a great product is is built on iteration, not on just one great idea. You know, so we're we wanted to make sure that we get the high quality users first. And you know, let them play with it. Let them tell us what was missing, what was great, and then the next batch of high quality users would get even better product. You know, so a little bit of patience goes a long way in this. Absolutely, and following what you said earlier, right? You ship it, and then you improve it. Yeah. Right. 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 So that's this is great. I'm very excited. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, and and so let's move into what's coming next for you, right? What's coming next for Kappa? You personally, where do you see all this going? It's uh, I'm pretty bullish on this online video trend, right? And um, one of my new favorite punchlines is is that the world's largest gym is not Gold's Gym or LA Fitness. It's Peloton. And it's becoming bigger as we speak. And with Kappa, our vision is to build the world's largest virtual coffee shop. That's incredible. That's, this yeah. Is to V1. This is just a V1, and we're just letting in Twitter users. But I can see Kappa for any community. You know, if you're Joe Rogan's podcast fans community, you can have a, you can have Kappas with each other internally within your community, you know, and so on and so forth, right? So I'm pretty bullish, almost irrational, because I'm when I'm talking to a lot of people, you know, people who are, like, so attached to old school way of, like, meeting in person, and like, okay, I have to drive across town, put on my suit and shake hands with people and get coffee for a, for a 15 minute video chat. Like, why, why would you need to do all that? Is I think there will be in, in person, virtual in person interactions. They can, I mean, I don't think they'll go away. They just will be precious and they will be pricey and they will be choosy. You know what I mean? And it's, it's, we will still do that, but it's like not for a, for a random casual coffee or a sales meeting or a, uh, you know, a small, yeah, low key event. So you you see that it seems like this is the natural progression, and then you are like you're seeing what's coming before anyone else, right? You have, you have these online forums where people, you know, they were behind their avatars, they're behind their screen names, getting to know strangers, and it was always like big news in the community when two people who had been friends for a while finally met in person, finally found out what each other looked like, right. And then we moved into a place where it was almost like voyeurism, where you're watching people you know, right? Whether yeah. it be on Twitch or, yeah. or whatever. So you're yeah. watching your friends do stuff, but you're not actually interacting with them in the same way that you're on even footing. And, and now right. that everyone is forced right. to be comfortable I mean, with yeah. Right. I mean, I, Eric, like this, this you know... Uh, I've had three or four uh, DM chats with investors and some of them are really seeing it, but it, it's, it's a uh, back to your point about you have to be a little bit I mean, crazy to live in the future before everybody gets there. 
you know, and I think all my crazy experiments have led me to do that. And, and like the very fact that you and I have never met with each other in person, but I feel like you're like one of, cut that part of maybe you're one of my best <laughs> friends now. So, so, very, so I think the, our video interactions just added depth to our social connection. It would have been impossible to know like you the way I know you. And the same with like so many of Atlanta's other makers I know. And like now all of my calls with everybody around the world, like Europe, you know, India, everywhere. I feel like I just know them better because of the fact that we're turning on video now, you know, yeah. because of the fact that we're looking at each other's screen sharing, you know, so it's, it's, it's the future and, you know, everyone will like eventually wake up to it. And I think it's for the best because I feel like if you were, if you were somebody who is, who doesn't have a lot of connections and you were stuck in Montana, you were screwed back in the day. <laughs> you had to go to the local like Joe Schmo coffee place and, you know, people would not talk to you. But now you are somebody on the internet. Everybody who was somebody on the internet today can become better and feel like they belong and feel like they can connect with somebody because of online video. And I think that's where we're tapping into with Kappa. You can find those people that you belong with. Yeah. You're not restricted exactly. to geography. Right. And I think with no code, we're seeing that, right? No code is one of the, probably everybody's like coming at me with this, like, hey, you like, you know, no code feels like, you know, there's a bullish case and there's, I'm like, I am the number one advocate, evangelist, champion, you know, pastor, or whatever you want to call me for no code. And I think as long as the people inside no code respect each other and root for each other and want to want the space to win, this has been the best community I was ever part of. You know, I know you feel the same way too. It's like, it's, it's, unbelievable that we're all doing these for free like a lot of people are, what like it's free why would you have to you know but um absolutely the the community really has a tone of generosity of uh, shared learning and of just lifting each other up yeah and you don't and get that with the community yeah, yeah. I mean, that's magic you're not gonna get that so easy with it and i think you know, so many of other tech's verticals uh, have been around long enough that they've gotten to the jaded place now. You know, I think no coach so new, it's like a baby. So everyone's like, there's the radical optimism in this space, you know, and uh, I'm just blessed and I'm just uh, grateful that I get to be part of this. Every day I wake up, I look at the friends that I'm surrounded with, the people like you I'm surrounded with, and I'm like, man, what a, what a fantastic community to be part of. And success and failure are secondary. It's back to our earlier point. It's about impact. And I genuinely feel like I receive your impact. You see, I'm the recipient, I'm a recipient of so many people's great kindness. And I genuinely feel that, believe that maybe I'm helping a little bit on my side too, you know? So, yeah. So with Kappa, I think the uh, the other big update is we're, we're going to keep doing the uh, beta and uh, we applied to Techstars. So we're going to see how that goes. And we were going to apply to... Thank you. We're going to apply to YC too, but there's a there's a um, couple of investors who are very interested in uh, in Kappa. So we're going to see. You know, we might raise a free seed. Um, we're going to see where this takes. But really, really excited. I'm excited for you. And so, my final question for you, my my closing question. Yeah. What advice, given all that you've gone through at this point, and the fact that you're on the precipice of what can only be described as greatness? What advice do you have for the people who might be wanting to follow in your footsteps? Uh, well, wow, wow. Okay, so... No pressure. No pressure, right? <laughs> Set it up that way, there's no pressure. Well, I think the, the real big thing that dramatically changed my life um, was knowing that, you know, everybody belongs in the world in their own unique way, you know? So learning to be authentic and not trying to fit in any of the archetypes that people like popularized or the media popularized and just being authentic, but also using, you know, um, how can I build something or create something new out of nothing to serve others? That's been my North Star, you know? And it was, I'm not telling you this is easy. This is so hard. And if the five years ago, KP would not have known this, but through a lot of stumbles and failures and like dead ends, I think I've learned that the less you think about yourself as the center of the universe, you know, and the more you think of others and excited for their welfare 
and excited to see them succeed or see them do their job one person better or find their matches or whatever one person better, the more you know you contribute to the world. And the more you see that yourself firsthand, you realize what the heck was I, what I was doing all this while. You know, that is, there's nothing more joyful than um, walking away feeling like, you know what, I did something meaningful today. You know, and so my that that's sound kind of oh, that transcends just bubble, right? That transcends to any 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 um, maker um, lifestyle. But specifically with bubble, I think a lot of people know and are aware, aware of all the challenges bubble has, or all the uh, you know uh, learning curves and steeps and all that stuff. But the real magic of bubble is being able to build full stack you no know, code products where you have front end, back end and the database and even connect to APIs. And essentially you're building a full blown web app on Bubble and you're that much closer to building your roles, building your next best product or next best success. So I would, I would just recommend people to um, keep at it. And I, a lot of people come to me with no code camp and no code advice, things that I do. And they say like, I started Bubble three days later, I quit it or four days later I quit. And I think, that's really a wrong way to do it. You just have to give yourself at least a full month, in my view, to enjoy it. You know, even if you figure it out in like four days, to enjoy it and learn how to build a full product is not that easy, regardless of whether bubble or not. You know, because there's so many elements in the product. You need to talk about community. You need to worry about the launch, pre-launch, and all that stuff. So, um, just keep building. You know, and and keep shipping and um, surround yourself with the five positive people you, you can come up with and um, be more service oriented, I guess. I love it. I absolutely love it. Especially, I feel like I've lived my whole life being community minded, being service minded. And, you know, I recognize that in you and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Eric, it's been a pleasure, man. You know, Thank you. It's, uh, you're, you're right. You know, it's, uh, I feel like we have the same spirit, you know, so I appreciate it. I appreciate you coming on today. Thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing what comes next and how Cup of Rose. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much. All right. All the very best to the podcast. Thank you all for listening. Be sure to rate us wherever you get your podcasts. Find us on Twitter at Bubble. And be sure to tag us when you launch your next no-code hustle. There's nothing we love more than seeing you tear down the barrier between real problems and tech-enabled solutions. All without code.